Welcome to the Safety Pro Podcast, where we help you manage workplace safety one episode at a time. And now, your very own Safety Pro, Blaine J. Hoffman. Okay, hey, welcome to the Safety Pro Podcast. This is episode two, Introduction to Worksite Analysis. Now, if you recall, I'm doing a series of episodes covering some basic you know, startup safety topics to get folks going managing safety in their business. And also, if you recall from episode one, I started off by talking about how to prepare to write your safety manuals. I covered some key points. The eight points, just to recap, was one, keep your sentences short and concise to the point. Number two, use the term you to convey ownership to the reader mainly uh, your employees. The third one was to use active verbs, making sure that everything is measurable and observable when you write these things. Number four, avoid technical jargon. Make sure you know your audience. Five, say what you mean in plain language. If you don't want folks to do something, say don't do that. Um, Number six, avoid legal ease. Number seven, revise your first draft at least once. Edit it several times if possible, and make sure, number eight, your written manual is complete. Make sure that it covers the regulatory requirements that apply to you in your company based on what it is you're doing or what industry you're in. Okay, now, I also discussed the fact that you've got to be able to keep this long-term perspective when writing your policies and procedures or any other manual, okay? You need to work from the top down. Start by getting that top management commitment first. This cannot be this middle management project that gets pushed. Encourage employee involvement. Uh, That'll create some buy-in. So get a group together, a team, to discuss what is most appropriate given the minimum requirements you have to meet. Also, You need to continuously provide training. Guys, I run into this all the time. Don't just issue this policies and procedures manual, roll it out, and then set it and forget it. You know, stick it on a shelf. You have to continuously visit this stuff through, you know, safety talks, periodically bringing up things in meetings, asking, you know, how the policies and procedures are working out on the shop floor or out on the job site. You know, always revisit this stuff. It isn't something you just roll out once and it's done, okay? You also, to that end, you have to develop a measurement and reporting system to be able to track progress or identify gaps in, uh, which is what I'll talk about here with hazard uh, analysis, worksite analysis and hazard identification, okay? Develop that measurement and reporting system. Also, provide effective communication when rolling out your program. Make sure folks understand exactly why you need a program, a written program. Don't expect quick, dramatic results within days or even weeks or months of implementing your safety manuals. All right? It's an investment that will take time to develop. So, here we go. This next episode... Before you can begin writing the actual manual, you need to know which hazards may be present in your workplace or which hazards your employees may be exposed to during the course of their work. So in order to do any of this, you need to assess the physical workplace as well as any job tasks for potential hazards. If you already have safety policies and procedures in place, but it's been a while since they were implemented and reviewed, then you can do what's known as a gap assessment, where you compare the current state of safety in real time out in the facilities on the job sites or with tasks. Compare that to the expected state of safety based on those policies and procedures that were already established, okay? A gap assessment. You find these gaps to what is versus what should be based on those policies and procedures. Okay, so for episode two, I will go over sort of an introduction to a worksite analysis or hazard identification and assessment process. According to OSHA, each employer has to assess the workplace to identify all hazards, have to evaluate new equipment, new materials, processes, and review safety and health information. 
This would need to be done initially, okay? Um, I always recommend at least every year after you kind of run through your safety program to make sure it still applies, that there haven't been any significant changes that need to be addressed, okay? Assessments, uh, they need to be recorded somehow. So you've got to keep records, and you have to make these available to OSHA upon request. Now, as always, employers with 10 or fewer employees are exempt, but I'm telling you right now, this is a good best practice. Just document this stuff no matter how many employees you have. It's going to help. Now, a worksite assessment means that managers and the employees analyze all worksite conditions and to identify and eliminate existing or even potential hazards. So there's a little what if at play here that you have to be able to do. Worksite assessments involve a variety of worksite examinations to identify not only existing hazards, but conditions and operations in which changes might create hazards down the road. Remember that. What if? You have to have some foresight and anticipate some of these things. From these assessments, then you can develop hazard prevention and control methods, which will then create the basis for your written policies and procedures. Now, I'm going to talk about five major areas that form a basis from which a hazard prevention and control uh, can be developed, all right? Five areas. One, surveys. This includes employee safety surveys, where maybe a perception survey or safety culture can be done. There are many companies out there that offer this service. Uh, you definitely need to craft a survey that addresses the concerns management has, as well as the hazards associated with your business and operations. It needs to be customized to your business operations and even in your industry. Just beware, there are a lot of canned surveys out there that may not get you what you need. So if you choose to buy or purchase a survey, you know, go with somebody who's going to craft this and tailor it to your business and industry. Other surveys that you could get involved in are industrial hygiene surveys. Now, at a minimum, all chemicals and hazardous materials in the workplace have to be inventoried. The hazard communication or HAZCOM program has to be reviewed if you already have one. And you may need to conduct some air samples and have those analyzed based on the industry you're in. So for many other industries, a survey of noise levels, and a review of any respirator programs, a review of ergonomic risk factors are also needed. These are all classified as surveys, okay? So number one, conduct any surveys that need to be conducted based on the hazards and the industry that you're in. Two, second area, change analysis. Anytime something new is brought into the workplace, whether it's a, a piece of equipment or even materials that are different, um, a new process, or an entirely new building, you're building a new building, a facility, you're moving into a new building, new hazards may be unintentionally introduced into the work area, work environment. So before considering a change for a work site, it should be analyzed thoroughly beforehand in the design phase, okay? Change analysis helps in, you know, heading off problems be before they develop. That's basically why you want to do a change analysis. So you may find a change analysis useful. Just to recap, anytime a building uh, is new or you're leasing a new facility, installing new equipment, using new materials, starting up a new process, or even when staffing changes occur. Uh, I've been involved in with some clients when there has been a significant turnover in an organization, they had to completely address safety in a new way because the old uh, you know, employee base, they kind of self-managed safety from the floor and managed hazards as they came up. And upper management didn't really realize you know, that the extent to which hazards were present out there. So with all these new employees coming in, they lost all that capital knowledge and they had to do what we would call a change analysis because personnel, a significant amount of personnel changed, okay? So uh, number one, conduct the surveys you need to conduct. 
Number two, conduct a change analysis when it's appropriate. Number three, conduct hazard analysis. Now, hazard analysis techniques can be complex, okay? So in some cases, this is needed. In most cases, though, a basic, you know, step-by-step -step review of the operation will work. The most common uh, technique used on this would be a job hazard analysis or a job safety analysis. So even if the job was originally designed and set up with safety in mind, you know, many bad habits or shortcuts made by employees, often called time savers, they may have been introduced along the way. So when you do a, an analysis for every job, then it will periodically put things back on track. So I will have a Safety Pro episode just dedicated to a safety analysis for jobs, job safety analysis. I'll have that real soon. Be on the lookout for that one. Now, other more sophisticated techniques are called for when there's like complex risk involved. Uh, I would uh, probably use the example of a process safety facility, uh, petrochemical, stuff like that, where a PSM program is at play. These techniques include like what if checklists, hazard and operability studies, failure mode and effect analysis, fault tree analysis, those types of things. They can get complex. Most of the time, it's a matter of breaking down routine job tasks, assessing them for hazards, and then coming up with some corrective measures, okay? Look out for that episode. It's going to be a good one. Well, we will, we will burn through how to conduct a job safety analysis. So that was number three, conduct hazard analysis as appropriate. Number four, safety and health inspections. Now, right here, of course, we're talking about routine safety and health inspections. These are designed to catch hazards that are missed at other stages, okay? This type of inspection should be done at regular intervals, generally on a weekly basis. Uh, depends on the size and scope of your particular business. Uh, you can get away with a monthly, you know, safety and health inspection of the facility or work area if it's a smaller shop. Uh, so, in addition, Procedures have to be established that provide a daily inspection of work areas by employees if they're operating machinery. A great example of this is we know, most of us know, that if you operate a forklift, you have to do a daily check before you use it, before each shift. Okay, so some areas already have this baked into the standard, the OSHA standard, that a daily safety check be completed. You can use a checklist that's already developed, or you can make your own. So you can base these on past problems you've run into and issues. You can create a checklist to kind of head that off. You can base a checklist off of standards that apply to your industry, like forklifts, confined spaces, fall protection, things like that, personal protective equipment. You can use input from employees. So you can create a checklist based on employee input saying, you know, hey, I would be comfortable if at least, you know, once a day we check this area. Your company's safety practices or rules, you could just say, hey, we're going to write a rule that says every work area is going to be inspected before each shift and documented on a checklist. So some important things to remember about inspections, okay? Inspections should cover every part of the work site, including parking lots, docks, back doors, fence lines, driveways, storage areas, electrical panels, mechanical rooms, fire extinguishers. You know, where do you gather for severe weather? Do people understand that plan? Do they have access to that area? The path to that area is clearly marked and kept clear. You know, don't just inspect the commonly accessed areas or just inspect where workers perform their tasks at machines. The entire kit and caboodle has to be inspected. They also should be done at regular intervals, as I've already said. I can't stress that enough. Pick a battle rhythm and stick with it, okay? How often are you doing these things? Also, how are these things getting documented? Where does, where does this stuff all get sent to? Where do we turn this stuff in? Who maintains this? Everyone should understand that. Who's doing the inspections? In-house inspectors, they have to be trained to recognize and control hazards. So you're going to have to do some training to spin folks up. You can't just hand them a checklist and say, hey, it's right on the checklist. It says to look for safety glasses on everybody. Well, you know, are they the right type? Are they glasses worn in dusty environments when goggles are needed? They may need a level of training to prepare them for, you know, kind of quantifying or qualifying, I should say, the items that they're looking for on the checklist. 
Also, identified hazards should be tracked to their correction phase. So there should be this loop back as an inspector writes something up in a work area. Somehow it should loop back to them or somebody responsible in that area that, hey, this was found and it's been taken care of and it's been corrected. Okay, so that's uh, number four, safety and health inspections. Number five, a records review. One example of a records review would be hazard reports. You know, whenever employees report a hazard, you should have a form to track all this stuff. So we know employees play a key role in finding and controlling hazards that could develop or hazards that already exist in the workplace. So a reliable system for employees to report is an important element of an effective safety and health system. The workplace must not only encourage reporting, but it has to value it. I've come across many clients that actually incentivize or have a recognition program to encourage employees to report hazards. It's often helpful to establish multiple ways for employees to report hazards. So depending upon their comfort level and the nature of the issue, there are several avenues to get concerns addressed. This could be following the supervisor chain of command, the old, hey, tell your supervisor bit or a safety and health committee member they can go to and confide in, or maybe even a voicemail box or a suggestion box. The bottom line is provide multiple ways for employees to report hazards. What you're trying to achieve there is there should be no excuse for an employee to not report in some way, shape, or form a hazard that they see or discover. So Recap, an effective reporting system has to have a policy that encourages employees to report safety and health concerns, has to have a uh, timely and appropriate response to the reporting employee, has to have a, a timely and appropriate action where valid concerns exist, so responding to these things. You also need tracking of required hazard correction. Okay, make sure you can prove you're tracking these things when they get turned in and you're actually correcting them. And it needs protection of the reporting employees from any type of reprisal or harassment. That is key. We have to make sure employees feel comfortable with, with reporting hazards to anybody. Another records review would be an accident or incident investigation process. So your accident and incident investigation is another tool that you can use to uncover hazards that were missed earlier on or that slipped by any of the other planned controls. But keep in mind, it's only useful when the process is positive and focuses on finding the root cause, not someone to blame. Now, all accidents and incidents should be investigated. You know, near misses should be considered an accident that almost happened, okay? The only reason is because it's usually a matter of luck that it was a near miss and not an accident. All the other conditions leading up to it almost injuring somebody or getting somebody sick or damaging property... All those conditions and precursors are the same, and you need to investigate it as if something did occur. Six key questions should be answered in the incident investigation and report. That is the who, what, when, where, why, and how. Thorough interviews, of course, have to be done, and the primary purpose of the accident investigation is to prevent future ones from occurring. So the results should be used to initiate a corrective action. So when you go back to do a records review and you're looking at past incidents and accident reports, you should also be looking at what was done about this, if anything. The final action recommended is to conduct an analysis of the injury and illness trends over time. So drag out the OSHA 300 log and see if you've got any patterns with common causes that can be identified so that you can prevent them. Review those OSHA injury and illness forms, okay? That's the most common form of pattern analysis that you're going to be able to do. But other records of hazards can be analyzed for patterns as well, such as inspection records, uh, employee hazard reports. So go back and, you know, see how many are getting turned in, which areas of the business get the most hazard reports uh, turned in. Uh, also, with the, you know, accident investigation forms or accident forms, you can look and see which shift occur uh, has the most injuries things like that so make sure that you're assessing and evaluating injury and illness records and any other records 
anything you can think of. I mean, really, there's nothing off limits here. Um, repeat hazards like repeat injuries or illnesses could indicate that controls aren't working. So patterns in hazard identification records can show up over shorter periods of time than accidents or incidents that would occur over longer periods of time. So anytime you see repeat hazards popping up, you should be catching that somehow. That's why a records review is critical, okay? I, I think you get the idea. Basically, look at anything and everything your employees or even the public can have access to or anything and everything that you produce on paper regarding safety and health. Look at job tasks that are performed, the tools and equipment that are, are needed, including any chemicals. Look at emergency procedures that are in place or that are not in place and are lacking. You know, how would you respond to an injury? Make sure you drill that and do a survey for that. Uh, look at repair and maintenance records. Look at work orders. All that stuff, okay? You, there really isn't anything you shouldn't look at. So, only then can you begin to see where your major hazards are, your minor hazards, and you may even uncover where policies and procedures and even training is needed based on the feedback from your employees and your observations of their work and a records review. So then you can take to paper with this information to write policies and procedures, now, as well as determine which engineering controls or work practices or personal protective equipment will be needed. So those are three options you have when dealing with hazards. They're called, known as the hierarchy of controls. One, engineering, two, work practices, three, personal protective equipment. So that's it in a nutshell. The hierarchy of controls provides a systematic way to determine the most effective and feasible method to reduce risk associated with a hazard. The reason why you need to know this is because when controlling a hazard, you should first consider methods that eliminate the hazard or substitute a less hazardous method or process. You have to hit that first. So you go, you start with number one. Now, this is easily done when designing a facility or process before it's actually in place. But if this is not feasible, you know, engineering controls such as machine guards, ventilation, things like that can be used to eliminate hazards you discover. Okay, now this process will continue down the hierarchy until you get to the highest level feasible control. Now, often you're going to use a combination of controls. So in cases where higher order controls like elimination and substitution do not reduce risk to an acceptable level, lower order controls like warnings, administrative controls, and PPE are then used to complement the other controls to reduce risk to an acceptable level. But personal protective equipment should always be considered a last resort. Always rely on that last. You better be able to demonstrate there was no other feasible way to eliminate or reduce a hazard other than putting protective equipment and gear on the employee and leaving the hazard present. Okay, so that's basically what you're doing by jumping past the other two controls and going right to personal protective equipment. So, Get started documenting these things, okay? Then you can begin writing. Review those five areas. Review any surveys that need to be done or that have been done. Conduct any change analysis or review any analysis of new equipment that has been done. Conduct hazard analysis of the workplace. Do your safety inspections and do your records review. I'm going to cover specific safety topics, much like chapters in your safety manual in subsequent episodes. You will be able to follow along as you continue to build on your written safety program going forward. But these first few episodes, we really got to lay the groundwork for you before we can get right into, you know, what you're going to write. Okay. So if you have the Safety Pro app for Windows devices, iOS devices, and Android, then you're going to be able to download all of this information as well as some generic sample checklists to use in conducting workplace safety audits, things like that along the way. You're just going to be able to download them right there on your device. Otherwise, if you don't have the Safety Pro app, then you can listen, of course, via iTunes or Stitcher app for Android. And of course, go to the website, consulthoffman.com. You can listen to all of our podcasts there, and you'll see the show notes 
and be able to get all this information as well through that. Keep in mind, our podcast is safe for work. So tell your coworkers to tune in as well and uh, as they learn about workplace safety management. If you have a safety topic you would like me to discuss or if you have a workplace safety question you want me to answer on the podcast, go to consulthoffman.com. Let me know. Now, until our next episode, stay safe. Thanks for listening to the Safety Pro Podcast. Be sure to visit www.consulthoffman.com for articles and information about safety services. To have Blaine read your question on the show, email him at customerservice at consulthoffman.com. Be sure to have two F's and two N's on Hoffman. Until next time, be safe.